You're going to have a wonderful presentation today from one of our uh, distinguished colleagues. We have a number of, aside from our own colleagues from the Medical Society and their distinguished guests, we have also a number of distinguished guests that they were invited by Dr. Davies. And we also have the Honorable Judge Collins Sites Jr., the Delaware Supreme Court Judge. Our pleasure and honor to have you here. And a number of residents and colleagues working with the, uh, our distinguished group. Dr. Davies. The background of Dr. Davies, Dr. Alan Davies, is very long. He told me that if you wanted to write it down, it will be almost a uh, textbook. With his permission, has been summarized to one page. And I'll try to uh, quickly mention that, but his background is a lot longer than that. Distinguished background. But I'll quickly introduce you to his background and after I reviewed this, it looks to me that he has been traveling all over the world, which included Vietnam too. Dr. Davies received his degree in chemical engineering at Penn State University. And he told me very quietly that was very important to get into the medical school with that background. He went on to the, uh, to the Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia and received his medical degree. His medical internship was at Jefferson Davis Hospital in Houston, Texas. This is the beginning of his movement. A general surgical residency followed at Jefferson Medical College, so he came back again to Jefferson. A fellowship in thoracic cardiac surgery was completed at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, which was followed by a stint as a thoracic surgery senior registrar in Plymouth, England, working with Sir Roland Belsey and Dr. Jack Griffiths. In 1968, he was drafted as a captain into the U.S. Army serving through 1969. He then enlisted with the Marines as lieutenant colonel and served from 1969 to 1970. After returning stateside from the Vietnam War, he started a solo private practice in Wilmington as a thoracic and cardiovascular surgeon. A year later, he was joined by the late Dr. Mustafa Oz with their partnership lasting for 35 years. He and Dr. Oz participated in a combined Jefferson Medical College Medical Center of Delaware Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery Residency Program. All 27 residents in the program passed their board examination because of their leadership and teaching capabilities. Dr. Davies retired from clinical practice in 2015 just a few years ago. He has published 43 papers 
in medical literature on thoracic and cardiovascular surgery. I haven't even published one. He published 43. As well as, as well, I'm sorry, as we all have a story to tell, and he's going to tell you a lot. We welcome Dr. Davies to teach us what it was like to be a surgeon during the Vietnam War. Being there at the time of the Tet Offensive, a turning point in the Vietnam War, which played a role in weakening U.S. public support for the war, and I remember that very well, fighting at the time of the Tet Offensive was the heaviest and the most sustained of the war. General William C. Westmoreland, and I heard his name so many times around that time, the commander of the United States forces compared the Tet Offensive to the Battle of the Bulge in 1944, Nazi Germany's last major drive in the World War II. I'm sure that a lot of you, if not all of you, remember those days. It gives me great pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker, Dr. Alan Davis. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Ali. Okay, are we live? Yep. Are we all live? Um, we're all live. <laughs> okay. Before uh, before we go on uh, very far here today, uh, I'd like to uh, yeah, I'd like to make this move. There we go. I'd like to uh, pay homage to. Uh, some of our colleagues who worked on the Contemporary Veterans Project, which was the impetus for really me coming here today to speak, and for the video recording that's being done to try to put this in the record a little bit. The brainchild of Dr. William Duncan, uh, as you see here, uh, Bill's attempt was to gain as much information as possible from the physicians who served in the military during the post-World War II era to the present time and to record the information for future generations. Uh, as you may know, Dr. Duncan previously had taken on the task of memorializing the founding of the founding fathers of the Medical Society of Delaware, as well as detailing information on Delaware military physicians who served in World War II. Working diligently to complete and see it through to fruition, Dr. Duncan passed away after completing the Contemporary Veterans Project, which was published in the December, uh, November uh, issue of the Delaware Medical Journal. Uh, if you haven't seen that, you ought to get one of those copies. It's a very detailed and uh, nifty study. The, uh, this picture is from a, uh, a little impromptu luncheon we had uh, on December 11th, which shows Dr. Duncan right here and Dr. Ann Alshuler, Bob Alshuler, who, who we lost just uh, soon after Bill died, and we got Ted Kester and Bob Rickards and myself. And before we go any further on that, I'd like to mention Mary Fenimore, who just took my picture. <laughs> Thank you, Mary, who was the aide-de-camp to Dr. Duncan during the uh, bringing that project to fruition. So Mary, thank you very much. And uh, yes. And way back in the back is my aide de camp, Mary LeJudas, who uh, really was, there you go, give Mary a, a, another round of applause. 
she brought, she was the impetus to get this thing going and put it in some sort of, some sort of formal um, presentation. Okay, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> okay, good morning, Vietnam. <laughs> you remember, you remember Robin Williams? Well, this is, this presentation is brought to you under the auspices of the Armed Forces Radio Network from July in sunny South Vietnam from an antenna about four feet tall on the top of a little tent at WWWTA in July. Uh, what I'm going to try to do today is give you a little taste of what the living conditions were for the doctors and the nurses, give you a little geography lesson of where the hell Vietnam was, a little history of the second and the 27 surgical hospitals where I practice my trade, a little interaction with Vietnamese nationals, and then the surgical side of it, I'm going to discuss a little bit about the things that occurred in the 1960s, uh, which were uh, fruits of the post-World War II era, where vascular surgery came into its own, liver resection using standard cancer surgery techniques in trauma situations, penetrating fragment wounds in the chest and indications for thoracotomy, and uh, something that not too many of you guys know about, but pericardial tamponade and wounds of the heart. Okay, get this going to right. Okay, this presentation has some graphic uh, pictures, and I'll tell you when you want to put your hands over your eyes. How did I get here? Well, how did I get here? Well, I've, I was finished my surgical residency at Jefferson in 1966 and was drafted into the Army, and they put me in something called the Berry Plan where they said, hmm, we don't really need you right now, so uh, go do something else. So um, I had another year to go on my thoracic uh, residency board eligibility, so I went up to the Mass General and did a little bit there at Harvard Medical School and uh, had another six months and went to England uh, where I served uh, as a senior registrar down near Plymouth uh, in the south, uh, in the southwest. Uh, at that point, uh, I uh, was also able to uh, work with Sir Ronald Belsey, who had been knighted by the Queen for his work in uh, gastrointestinal and pediatric cardiac surgery. And so all of a sudden, they wanted me to uh, join up. So here's the garden spot of Southeast Asia, South Vietnam. As you can see, the arrow points at Chulai, and this is the uh, mm -hmm. uh, a map showing the major uh, battles that occurred during the Tet Offensive, which uh, was uh, really the the Vietnamese New Year, and uh, we didn't figure that anything was going to happen during New Year's when all of the Vietnamese went back to their roots in the small villages, but. We were to learn that uh, that was the time they decided to really come at us. Uh, the the black dots are the uh, the black stars are the major battles that occurred, and I don't know why uh, we didn't get one at Chulai because uh, uh, we had more casualties than anybody in town. Uh, so that's where the second surgical hospital. There is the operating room on the second surgical hospital. This is on top of the uh, cliff uh, looking out over the South China Sea. That's where the Marines came on board in 1967 with the first amphibious landing since the Incheon landing in Korea. Uh, this was our OR. Uh, and as you can see over at the um, right hand side of the picture is a uh, there are a couple of uh, very nice trailers that were air conditioned and that's where the nurses stayed. Every once in a while we get invited over for tea. 
You're supposed to, Tom, you're supposed to laugh. <laughs> okay. Okay, there's yours truly, dressed in, uh, I, I, I really, uh, this is the shirt I should have had on. This thing is 50 years old and uh, sort of still fits. This is the, uh, the top of that cliff where the second surgical hospital was. Then you went down to a nice sandy beach in the South China Sea. There was a, uh, an, uh, an old, sec uh, an old uh, landing craft, an LST, that was uh, uh, pushed up on one of the coral reefs there. And I, I, uh, I don't know where that picture got, but it was, uh, it, that was one I missed. Okay, now I'm just back from a, what they call a dust off in a UE uh, helicopter. This is our shower room. And as you can see in the back, that's one of our bunkers. We were rocketed uh, on a pretty uh, regular basis by the VC. This is uh, a hooch. Uh, which was where we lived. There was uh, about four guys in each one of these. Uh, there was at least a roof over your head. And th this is one of our mama sons. Uh, she's all dressed up and would come into work uh, in, every once in a while with her Sunday best on. And this is what it looked like during the monsoons. And there she is in her working clothes. Everybody had the, the old uh, black pajamas. As you can see, there's a uh, one of our cots out in the uh, out in the rain. Here's our chapel. It was the nicest uh, building on uh, on the base. Uh, it was a non-denominational chapel, and it also served as the officers' club. Uh, but there was no wine, whiskey, or beer in the officers' club, so things were pretty lean. This is looking down from the second surgical hospital on the beach. And as you can see, some of the waves of the South China Sea are uh, sort of breaking on that uh, coral reef. The entire uh, coast of uh, Vietnam was uh, beautiful sandy beaches that would, um, are now being used as uh, vacation spots in Southeast Asia. Here is a, a building on the beach that served as a triage center for the guys that hit the beach in 1967. And this, uh, we later turned into a, Vietnam, a Vietnamese ward, where uh, it was not, it was not uh, commonly known, but when, uh, when we went out to get our wounded from the battlefield, we took everybody, and uh, uh, we operated on an awful lot of uh, VC, uh, North Vietnamese regulars, and uh, Maybe that's why some of the, uh, that's why we still have a pretty good reputation in Vietnam. Uh, they like the Americans now. The 27th Surgical Hospital was the unit that I was uh, originally assigned to, but when uh, my uh, time to leave uh, Seattle for Vietnam in December of uh, 19. 68, uh, that hospital was uh, on a ship in uh, Charleston Harbor. They were a little bit behind their uh, schedule. So that's how I wound up in the second surgical hospital in, in uh, July. Uh, so the 27th surgical hospital was my other hospital. This was a uh, rather famous hospital in the South Pacific theater having been in Luzon, New Guinea, Leyte, Papua, and uh, supported basically the uh, first and third marine divisions. So I want to show you the contrast where the two different hospitals were and what the conditions were. The second surgical hospital is up here on the beach just out of... Uh, this baby's not... I think you can see uh, the, the yellow uh, pointer shows the second surge. The 27th Surgical Hospital is right there by that black line. That black line is uh, Vietnam 1, one number, US Route 1A, 
their main up and down north-south highway. Everything on the left-hand side was VC land, and uh, the stuff on the right-hand side was where we lived. The only problem was the 27 Surgical Hospital was right on the main drag. And uh, as I show you a little bit, and you can see the airfield, the airfield's behind us. So in, in order to get to the airfield and destroy it, they had to go through our position there at the 27 Surgical Hospital. Not very good planning, but it was uh, uh, a chance to uh, treat the nationals of Vietnam so that uh, uh, we would be loved and liked a little bit better. Okay, here's the 27 Surgical Hospital. It finally got off the boat and over across the Pacific and uh, up to uh, Chulai. These are Quonset huts, um, and Quonset huts are, uh, were first manufactured by the Navy in 1941 when they uh, needed an all-purpose type building that could be uh, put up very quickly with not skilled labor. So I guess they figured the Navy Seabees were in skilled labor, so uh, these were what we got. That is the, uh, the doorway to the emergency room. Those uh, Red Cross vehicles are hardly ever used. All, all uh, of the transportation was uh, by UE helicopter. And the, uh, that macadam pad extended out 100 yards and was the uh, chopper pad. Here's the Chulai Hilton. <laughs> which was our our new barracks and you can see that there's a uh, a bunker right there uh, between the two units the nurses unit was on the starboard side and uh, we're on the port side here that um, uh, bunker served us well as we did receive uh, a lot of short rounds that were aimed at the uh, air, airstrip uh, just behind us here's the main gate to the uh, 27th Surgical Hospital. The mountains in the background are the, uh, uh, the mountain range that uh, went north and south. Uh, Route 1 was right there where those telephone poles were. And as you can see, the Mamasans are hanging out the wash. Okay, now these, this is uh, Florence Nightingale, uh, 1968 style. Uh, these young ladies were almost all products of the nursing uh, school of the United States, schools of the United States Army. Uh, and as soon as they finished their nurses training, off they went to Vietnam. Um, nurses, the nurses worked 24-7, had 12-hour shifts, and every once in a while got, when the war wasn't cranked up, would get a 12-hour uh, day off. Uh, every and every this is a morale booster. Uh, it just uh, it made everybody happy to see the ladies with their with their dresses on and uh, I think it, obviously they were smiling there. But I'll tell you there were a lot of sheer, tears shed by those girls in their job. Okay, we didn't wear too many pretty dresses and there's. Uh, me without my shirt, I guess, and uh, my buddy uh, Al Tassi from the University of California, Berkeley, uh, who collaborated with me on a paper on pericardial uh, tamponades that we uh, treated at, at the 27 Surgical Hospital. Al unfortunately committed suicide in 1972, which was one of the first of several of my good friends who went the same way. Uh, there's a F6 with my bridge partner. I was always fascinated by airplanes and I had the chance to do a little flying. Uh, the, uh, the pilots uh, of these, that was Marine, uh, Marine Group 12, Tomcats. These pilots uh, were extraordinary people. They were almost all field grade officers. They wouldn't give a, one of these planes uh, a, a second lieutenant or a captain. And uh, they flew somewhere near 400 sorties each, which is all in close fire support. These guys were 
uh, between 38 and 41 years old. They were about 10 years older than most of the docks and about 20 years older than uh, uh, the, the grunts that they were taking care of. Okay, here's a F100 uh, F1000 stop in my Nikon camera. Uh, and this, they were actually shooting at us. This is a 122mm rocket that uh, sort of landed short of the uh, airfield. Uh, as I told you, uh, we were strategically placed on the perimeter of the uh, Chulai Air Base. These pictures I, uh, I hadn't looked at for 50 years, but when I, uh, uh, when I did, uh, I was uh, sort of surprised that it was so close. <laughs> okay, here we are. Uh, how do we interact with the Vietnamese nationals? Uh, this is a little island off the, uh, off the coast of Chu Lai. It was about five miles off and it was about five miles long. And this is the south end of the island. We're coming in uh, on a, uh, a little uh, trip out to help the, uh, the villagers with their public health problems and treat some of them. And this is a bunch of kids there having a great time playing soccer right on the uh, big old runway. The other end of the island was uh, occupied by the, uh, by the VC and there was a, a, a truce. Uh, they would go there uh, every once in a while. You would see little, little boats go out there and uh, they'd, they'd hit the beach for a day or two and uh, Sometimes some of our guys would get a chopper right over and hit the beach on the southern side of the island. Strange place. Uh, when I first started our little talk, I was going to give what Robin Williams made everybody familiar with uh, when he said, Good morning, Vietnam. Uh, you uh, Navy corpsmen, it's eight bells, and for you lance, lance corporals in the army, it's zero nine hundred hours, and for you marine second lieutenants, Mickey's on the twelve, and Donnie's Donald's on the nine. And if you're students of uh, time, which meant nothing in Vietnam, you would know that none of those things matched. Well. You're in Nam, none of those things matched. Here's Tam Ki. Tam Ki is a little uh, town be just south of Da Nang, 20 miles, and just north of Chu Lai, 20 miles. It's a provincial hospital where we put our U.S. size army beds in there to help uh, the, uh, some of the post-op Vietnamese that we operated on. The Navy corpsmen would, would work this hospital from about 8 to 5 during the day and then leave and at night several uh, Vietnamese doctors would come in and run the place at night. This was a, uh, uh, a truce that uh, didn't, was never broken and uh, just shows a little bit of the confusion that existed. Nobody knew what time it was and nobody knew whose hospital it was. Okay, and what would Vietnam be without a visit from Bob Hope and the Supremes? Here we are in the Chu Lai Bowl. There's a, the arrows are on a, a chopper that's a patrolling and, a, and a, there's a patrol boat out there in the South China Sea. This is Bob Hope and Diana Ross and the Supremes. They came over to the 27th Surgical Hospital and Diana Ross gave all the guys a kiss and it was, uh, it was a great, uh, it was a great to do. Okay, I got a couple of pictures here that might be a little bit graphic, but I think them is going to demonstrate uh, a few things. This is a, a young Vietnamese boy who uh, has uh, obviously a laparotomy. He's got a bandaged up left arm, and he's got a gastrostomy tube in place. Uh, he didn't have an NG tube in place because all of these folks had intestinal parasites, and uh, if you've ever seen Ascaris, they look like white night crawlers. 
there, um, and everybody that had an abdominal wound um, had that we had to explore would have night crawlers everywhere. And sometimes the uh, night crawlers would crawl up the NG tube, and it upset our nurses. So we would we put in G tubes so they'd crawl out the G tubes. Uh, this is the post-operative picture. This kid was hit by shrapnel in the uh, left arm. There's an arterial graft in place, <coughs> which uh, saved his arm. And this is something you heart you never see. Has anybody in this room ever seen lockjaw tetanus? Okay, rare, a rare baby. Uh, there's a guy who is a Vietnamese uh, who is in the throes of tetanus. Uh, interestingly enough, we didn't really know what to do with this guy, and we paralyzed him for three days. And when he woke up, we obviously gave him IVs and, and some... Uh, uh, super, super saturated uh, sugars. But when he woke up, he was actually alive and uh, had his full faculties. Here's another uh, war wound where he got shrapnel in the abdomen. Uh, you can see a little mesentery sneaking out there. He was, uh, and he had both antecubital fossa blown away. The, the left arm was amputated, the right one was saved with another uh, graft. Okay, here's uh, another vascular surgical situation. Uh, this, this boy was hit in the femur and his superficial femoral artery transected. Uh, this type of injury would have, uh, in every war up until, up until Nam, would have resulted in amputation. Uh, because of the uh, level of training and the level of vascular uh, training that we had. Uh, we had four surgeons with us in our, uh, on my team and uh, everybody had been trained at a university uh, teaching hospital, Ohio State, Calgary, University of Kansas, and everybody was very facile at getting harvesting veins uh, from the saphenous because they were being used for jump grafts for coronary artery surgery. And so we were able to uh, we were able to, to uh, get veins for uh, our vascular reconstruction. Now this, you can see it, that vein graft is in place. Uh, we had pedal pulses and uh, just to show our documentation that we had a good, we had a good graph. This is a uh, a shot that shows his femur and the vein graft in place. You can see one little grape-like bubble, which was uh, a small valve in the reverse vein graft. Uh, this was a uh, a uh, something that was pointed out by my buddy Tom LeJudis back there, that uh, how the heck did you ever get that shot? Well, it was a one shot, uh, 20 cc's of uh, IV Conray con contrast being pushed in manually and then shoot with a cross table lateral. Uh, today we have uh, um, million dollar uh, x-ray machines and fluoroscopy to, to uh, get pictures that sometimes aren't that good. So, that's a demonstration of how vein grafts have been able, have been a, were able to help save extremities. Here's another uh, situation uh, in a vascular surgical vein that demonstrates how to turn a uh, bad situation into a catastrophe. Uh, four o'clock in the morning, uh, somebody calls me and says, hey, I'll come on over here. We got a kid with a neck full of blood, so I zip over to the OR, and there he was. He was a great big guy with a blonde crew cut and having a heck of a time breathing and had a neck full of blood. Uh, as I was uh, trying to scrub up a little bit, my very good friend, Colonel Lila Bosch, 
gave him a shot of uh, Curare and took a look with the scope and it's Al, I can't see the damn cords. Okay, catastrophe. Um, at that point, uh, we had to get an airway and we had to control the bleeding, so. Next. There's the uh, wound open. I was able to get the uh, a quick uh, uh, cervical neck incision, get my finger around the guy's trachea. We pulled the trachea up a little bit and uh, made an incision. There was not a drop of blood in his trachea, which was wonderful because he hadn't aspirated. I was able to, then I uh, took the endotracheal tube, stuck it in the distal end of the trachea, and while I was doing that, my very good friend Al Tassi had packed the upper part of the wound uh, with uh, several big laps, and so now we had an airway, but we didn't know where all the bleeding was coming from. Uh, well, there's where the bleeding was coming from. Between the two clamps, you can see the internal mammary, uh, the internal uh, carotid artery has been uh, degloved on the top. And all the bleeding was coming from the circle of Willis. If you guys, uh, especially, do we have any, where's Lanny Edelson? <laughs> the circle of Willis is a, uh, a vascular formation at the base of the skull where the vertebral arteries communicate with the carotid arteries. And if you have good circulation and a, a complete circle of Willis, you get tremendous back bleeding. And you actually don't need your internal carotid artery or one of your vertebrals. So there was no way we were going to be able to reconstruct this. We'd have had to take half his skull off to get the distal plug in. So we ligated it. The bleeding stopped. Closed the wound. Put in the trach. Put in the trach. There's the old rush trach tubes that we, do, uh, tracheostomy tubes that we don't do any, use anymore. Uh, I don't know whether you remember those or not, Dick or Gene. They were made in Germany and had high pressure cuffs and when they were inflated, uh, caused most of the uh, tracheal stenoses that uh, occurred after uh, Nam. Okay, the end of that story is three hours later, my old friend Lila Bosch, who was, let's see, I think Lila was about 45 years old at that time. She was one of the senior uh, nurse anesthetists that, that were, was in the Army. And she was the, she was the uh, nurse anesthetist who injected the, the, um, the dart that, that caused the catastrophe. She was sitting on Jim's bed Given a, a sipping him, letting him sip her a cup of coffee with a straw. This kid had absolutely no residual uh, problems from that from that episode that night. Okay, uh, I know I'm getting a little bit long here, but this is a uh, the second problem that we had was controlling liver wounds. As you know, the liver is a very very vascular uh, organ. And um, we would have one heck of a time trying to suture it closed. We had blunt end needles that didn't rip into the parenchyma. And after, after a couple of uh, weeks of this, um, we came upon, well, you know, we all know how to do liver resections for um, cancer of the liver, metastatic lesions, etc. So we started to do formal liver resections. If the wound was in the right lobe, we took out the left and, the, and vice versa. And here's an example of a post-op uh, left lobe, uh, left uh, hepatic lobectomy. The guy uh, received a, uh, a large uh, fragment wound of his left lobe of uh, his liver, which we could not stop. But when the liver does have segments, not quite as good as the lung, but we were able to do a formal resection here and actually save these guys. Because it was, you get shot in the liver with, a, with an AK-47 and you were, you were finished um, because of the kinetic energy given off from these uh, uh, high velocity weapons. There's a, uh, an example of the, of the resected specimen. 
So we actually did try to act like academic surgeons. We, we sent the pathology uh, down to the pathologist as a winner, <laughs> okay. Uh, these are, okay, uh, the, the third thing that was very interesting about how we uh, went about our business with uh, thoracic surgical wounds. In, in the first uh, year or so of the Korean conflict, almost everybody that had a chest wound got a thoracotomy, got their chest open, because we had to control the bleeding and the air leak. Well, about 90% of those guys died. Uh, from that intervention. In the, the, the last year of the Korean conflict, it was flipped. The, the guys that were on the front lines had decided that not everybody needs to have their chest open. And so many of the, many of the, uh, those cases were treated with chest tube drainage and, uh, and transfusions. And 90% of them stopped. Uh, the, 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 the blood pressure in the pulmonary parenchyma is 20 over 10, and that is that, and with all the thromboplast and in the lung, um, made for a very good clotting situation. It, it, and then, you know what, the same thing happened in Vietnam. In 1966 and 67, everybody got their chest cracked. Wrong. We finally tumbled to the same things that the guys in Korea tumbled to. And there's a situation uh, where there's a, there's, you can see some of the, the first and second rib is shot away. There are two chest tubes in the left side, one in the right side. This guy uh, was treated with chest tube drainage. Uh, let the, uh, the, the, the left side is, uh, uh, it's fairly well expanded, but still some residual blood. Uh, this, our, we made a rule that if you had to receive one pint of blood per hour for four hours, you were a candidate for thoracotomy. And as I said, in the last two or three years of the Vietnam conflict, only 10% of the uh, fragments of the chest were operated on with 90% recovery. And uh, I use that, I use those rules during my entire career because we did have some members at a knife and gun club here in Wilmington, Delaware. Okay, thanks for letting me talk a little bit. I think that that's, uh, I, I have another, I have another uh, one little anecdote to talk about and that is our, our treatment of pericardial tamponades. Uh, up until uh, the Vietnam War, uh, they were either unrecognized many times or uh, not treated at all. Uh, we uh, amazingly had 10 cases that we recognized uh, of pericardial tamponade during my stay in, in, uh, in Southeast Asia. The advantage that we had is that we had excellent uh, diagnosticians. A pericardial tamponade is a wound of the heart by a uh, fragment, not a high velocity missile uh, uh, such as a, an attack rifle, but a fragment which would penetrate the pericardium, which is a cellophane like wrapping around the heart, and then the heart and cause some bleeding into the sac, into the pericardial sac, which would self-seal in many cases if it was a small wound and then the bleeding would occur into the pericardial sac and actually squeeze the heart and so one of the big signs is central venous pressure your pressure in your right side of the heart uh, would elevate and one of the most common uh, things that we would see would be the, the uh, anesthetist would tell us uh, Gee, Al, the, uh, the blood's coming back out of this IV. Well, that was because we had central venous pressures that were high. And we were able to save nine out of 10 of the patients that we had. And actually, we published that uh, uh, paper in the Annals of Surgery while we were still deployed. 
Okay, I think that's just about enough for me today. Uh, if, does anybody have any comments or questions? The field's open. How long were you in the uh, I uh, was in for my first tour uh, from January of 68 until uh, the end of December of 68. And it's interesting, Barry, I came back and uh, the situation was very, very bad politically in this country. Uh, Wilmington, as you know, was on fire. Uh, Watts was on fire. Uh, we were baby killers, right, Bill? And uh, uh, I uh, actually re-upped. I was like the crazy helicopter pilots who, who went back for second and third tours and almost all died. Um, I, uh, I was very dissatisfied with what I had come back to. I had a very bad sense that I had left my team where it was, and so to answer your full question, I went back for another eight months. Uh, but I always wanted to be in the Marine Corps, and I made a deal that my that my commission would be switched, and I traded that for another eight months in uh, sunny July. Yo. How much did the experience in Korea with MASH help you guys in Vietnam? Well, you know, when I first came home, I, I went to see MASH. And I, I couldn't, and honest to God, I couldn't stand it. I, I left the, I left the, the theater. Uh, I think that was because I thought they were sort of making fun of it. But as as the years have gone on, uh, uh, you know there was a great similarity. Uh, there were great similarity uh, in that situation, and the camaraderie was uh, tremendous. But one one strange thing is that all through my life I've tried to keep in in touch with my with my, uh, my buddies, like my resident buddies at Jefferson and the guys that I w went to college with. And, but, you know, when I got back from Vietnam, uh, I lost track. I, I lost track of everybody. I know that, uh, and, and I, I guess that was on purpose. Nobody wanted to, to get together and hang out, you know? Uh, I know two of my my very good friends committed suicide, uh, uh, and one of my uh, teammates, Dick Drews from Princeton, New Jersey, died on his way home when somebody put jet fuel into a 123 gasoline engine uh, cargo plane, and 80 guys died on the way out of Chulai. So. Uh, it was that's that's just an interesting point. Uh, the camaraderie was tremendous when we were there, but when it ended, it ended. Yes. Uh, first off, thank you for everything you did for your service. Secondly, do you have any? Have you been back to Vietnam? And do you have any follow-up of either the Americans or the Vietnamese you took care of? Well, uh, yes, I've been back to Vietnam. I went back about three years ago, I guess it was, and uh, uh, went to uh, Da Nang, uh, flew into the same runway, 88, that I had flown into 50 times, you know, 40 years later, 40 years before. Um, da Nang is a, I remember it as dog patch, it was just torn apart. And Da Nang is now a sparkling city with uh, a beautiful airport, which is our airfield, and a, uh, a very, uh, a full, and a full uh, six foot statue of Colin Montgomery, the English golfer in, in front of the airport. I, I couldn't believe it. Uh, the, uh, 
of all places, huh? <laughs> I mean, call it. The Americans um, in South Vietnam, the, the South Vietnamese like the Americans. And I think that's because a couple of things. One was we were respectful of them. And we, we tried not to hurt the, the nationals. And that we also cleared the battlefield. When, when, when we evacuated all our guys, we also didn't walk around like some of our adversaries in the past and shoot everybody that was moving. We picked them up and brought them back and tried to, tried to fix them. Yo. Is that true that the only real winner in the war is Madison? No, uh, there's uh, one other winner. That's generals. They get promoted. <laughs> I have a question. If they said that in the time of Vietnam, if they could get you off the battlefield alive with these punching pots and everything, mortality rate was only 1%. That's never happened in history before. That's right. Yes, uh, there were a couple of things that uh, that really led to that. That one was the uh, the expertise of the uh, of the, uh, the physicians who were there, and that was a uh, that was really the uh, the benefit of the Berry Plan. They didn't take you until you knew what you were doing, um, and uh, the the other uh, point was that you really had to come in in a basket to die. We used the, the scoop and run technique uh, which is the chopper would land at the LZ and pick up the wounded and in they came. Uh, I started uh, because of my love of helicopters and flying I started traveling with those guys which was uh, a little out of the ordinary and I could have got court-martialed and sent to Vietnam if that would have happened, you know. So anyway, uh, we would do treat on transport. And I had my little, uh, my little package of uh, my cut down and uh, a couple of freezers full of blood and IV fluids and uh, chest tubes, trach tubes. And I was able to, uh, we, to develop what we called uh, treat on transport. And, uh, and that is really used today because they're implanting uh, surgeons in fighting units. I don't know if you guys remember Dr. Bill Kraut, uh, who was one of our neurosurgeons. His son uh, was with the unit, he's a thoracic surgeon. He was with a unit in Af an active unit in Afghanistan as a thoracic surgeon. Um, so the, the treat on transport has been, you, instead of bringing the badly wounded, we sort of went there and uh, took our doctor's bag with us. But you need to take them right out of the air. You take them to Germany for cancer. Take, take care of them. It's, it's extraordinary what happened with that. Say, say that again. But you would actually take people completely out of the area. We didn't have to say that. The mass units didn't make sense in a war like that. Yes, well, we had all the forts. We had Fort Ticonderoga, which was Chulai Base. We had Fort Da Nang, which was Fort Pittsburgh. And they had everything else. Okay, and those, and those uh, rockets that you saw landing short, well, that was no more different than the Indian shooting fire arrows into the unit. Uh, they, and, and the tactics, were very similar to the tactics that were used in the French and Indian Wars. Yeah. Now, my question was that uh, there was any hospital uh, hospital ship on the side of the border of the, the Vietnam uh, Yes, uh, the sanctuary uh, was in Da Nang Harbor and Dr. Katz was on the uh, sanctuary. Uh, Dr. Katz just retired. Uh, down in BB, uh, he was a surgeon on the. On the, the other question I have, that has nothing to do with the, the Vietnam War. This is a question about the surgeons. At what age the surgeon should uh, stop 
practicing surgery because the statistics showed the surgeons over 60 years old, they making more mistakes than surgeons under the age of 60. Well, I think that depends on your genes, you know. Um, <laughs> some, of us, some of us deteriorate a little faster than others. Um, uh, I think that, um, sure, the, you can make up um, you can make up as experience what you lose with uh, maybe staying power and doing 20 cases a day, things like that. Uh, I think that uh, trauma surgeons, uh, there are a lot of things that happen in trauma that happen so fast that unless you're really aware of it or seen it before, it goes right past you and you didn't even see it. Uh, I think that um, maybe I can't get a, a right angle around a pulmonary artery as slickly as I once could, but I think that in a triage situation, uh, I think that experience counts. And I would, I would put my vote there. Uh, I, I, and I think it's, uh, it's very important for the, to determine when you're ready to step away. Um, I, I stepped away. Uh, I had some very good friends that I, I asked uh, to appraise me. And you gotta have a good friend to appraise you, you know. And they didn't, they kept, they kept not appraising me. And uh, so I, I quit uh, when I was 78. Uh, the last case I did was a right upper lobectomy for a cancer of the lung, and uh, I did it in an hour and 20 minutes, skin to skin, which is fairly acceptable time. And uh, that day I thought, you know what? Time. So uh, that question is, is very difficult, and you know, uh, CJ, hey. difficult question. I heard that the Yes. Al, I heard, the I had, uh, interest in your mash unit. I was in the Army mash unit in Nanke and I had the first air cap. Yes. And they had 500 helicopters there. So they had all the assaults as well as the uh, rescue ones and the cranes and the The, the dust offs. So, we had, we were in a place that uh, is now a resort. I mean, it's a beautiful spot if there wasn't a war going on. But uh, 90, I think 95% of the certain people that we got went home all right. The only ones we sent out were the head cases that went down to the night. Yes. But uh, it's something you won't forget. Yeah. Well, we had a neurosurgeon with us for a little while. And uh, he, was, uh, he was 32 years old, he was from Harvard, and uh, nothing that you would expect from Harvard. Uh, he was not overrated. Uh, he uh, actually was doing uh, flaps for uh, head trauma uh, before it became the, the standard in uh, Afghanistan, uh, but he only lasted about four months, and uh, they took him off to uh, Da Nang and or down to Saigon. And you had another question? Okay, I heard that in China, in China, the in women, women surgeon, they should stop practicing surgery by age of fifty-five. Uh, I think. Yeah, well, I, 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 I would sort of, I would sort of think that the girls could last longer than the boys, uh, and I think 55. Uh, well, at 55, uh, I work with you guys, and uh, we were putting clamps on the aorta and sewing it back together in the middle of the night. So, I think 55 is a little premature. Well, that's what we meant. Yeah. Okay. But they're racist. Hmm. Maybe they are racist. Yes, that's right. Thank you very much.